The U.S. Department of Energy is expected to announce a milestone in nuclear fusion technology. Scientists say it could be revolutionary as the world looks for a cheap renewable alternative to fossil fuels. We'll bring you that announcement live as soon as it gets underway right here on CBC News Network. But for now, I want to bring in Bob McDonald. He's the host of CBC's Quirks and Quarks. He's also the author of The Future is Now, Solving the Climate Crisis with Today's Technologies. Bob, welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Okay, so while we're waiting for the U.S. Energy Secretary to announce what's being called a major scientific breakthrough, how are you feeling about all of this? Well, it's about time. You know, there's a joke in the fusion industry that fusion has been 10 years away for the last 50 years. <laughs> so they've been working on it for a long time. But this is a, a major step in that finally they have achieved uh, break even. They, they went beyond break even, which means they got more energy out of a fusion reactor than they put into it. Uh, so that's that's a good step, a major step in the right direction. And now, you know, Bob, we're going to have to break this down for folks, too, because many Canadians may not be familiar with nuclear fusion energy. So tell us how exactly this works. Right. Well, it's different from the way we're producing nuclear power now, which is nuclear fission. So what we're doing now is we're taking atoms that have very large, complicated nuclei, like uranium, that have a lot of particles in the center, uranium-235, 238, and if you hit them in just the right way, they will split, and you get a lot of energy out of that. You get a lot of heat, you can boil water, make steam, generate electricity. The problem is these pieces that are left over can be radioactive, and that's the radio active waste that we have to deal with. Fusion is the opposite of that. You start with much smaller pieces. You start with uh, isotopes of hydrogen, and instead of splitting them apart, you're causing them to fuse together. They don't want to do that. Atoms don't like to fuse, so it takes a huge amount of energy to make them fuse. That's why they need incredible temperatures above 100 million degrees, which is hotter than the center of the sun. And when you fuse these things together, what you're left over with is something that is less than the sum of its parts. So there's this extra particle left over, and that goes shooting off at very, very high speed, and that's the energy that you capture, this extra neutron that's left over. And the product called helium, well, it's helium. That's what you fill balloons with. It doesn't uh, heat up the atmosphere, and it's not radioactive. So that's the whole thing here. It's clean energy. And the fuel that you get, the uh, this, this hydrogen fuel, you can get that out of seawater. You, you can get it everywhere. It's very, very cheap. So the concept, the scientific concept, is to duplicate the energy of the sun here on Earth in a totally clean way. And until today, it's taken more energy, more energy to generate that 100 million degrees than the amount of energy that we've been getting out. Now they finally crossed that threshold, so we'll see what happens from this point. This is exactly the explainer we needed. And just as you were doing that, we know here that the U.S. Department of Energy spokesperson has come up right now, and we are going to take you to that announcement. And that is creating more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. It's the first time it has ever been done in a laboratory, anywhere in the world. Simply put, this is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century. Or as the president might say, right? right? <laughs> I do think he probably did say this is a BFD. <laughs> Researchers at Livermore and around the world have been working on this moment for more than 60 years. So what does this accomplishment do? Two things. First, it strengthens our national security because it opens a new realm for maintaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deter deterrent in an age where we do not have nuclear testing. Ignition allows us to replicate for the first time certain conditions that are found only in the stars and the sun. And the second thing it does, of course, is that this milestone moves us one significant step closer 
to the possibility of zero carbon, abundant fusion energy powering our society. If we can advance fusion energy, we could use it to produce clean electricity, uh, transportation fuels, power heavy industry, so much more. It would be like adding um, a power drill to our toolbox in building this clean energy economy. So today we tell the world that America has achieved a tremendous scientific breakthrough, one that happened because we invested in our national labs and we invested in fundamental research. And tomorrow, we'll continue to work toward a future that is powered in part by fusion en energy. Fortunately, private sector investment in fusion research is already booming. It has reached nearly $3 billion in last year alone, and we've heard from professors that interest among students has never been higher, which is terrific. And that's why the Biden-Harris administration is aiming to capitalize on this moment. Today's announcement is a huge step forward uh, to the president's goal of achieve, achieving commercial fusion within a decade. But there's still a lot more to do, so much more. We'll continue to work uh, toward that goal and find other ways to progress to reach fusion energy. So for example, in September, the Department of Energy made a $50 million investment for public-private partnerships to start working toward uh, fusion pilot plant designs. And we're partnering with the Office of Science and Technology Policy to map out the president's bold vision for driving that commercial fusion in the next decade with the highest safety standards, with cost-effective, equitable uh, deployment that positions American businesses to lead and communities to thrive, and with a skilled workforce that's diverse and inclusive. This is what it looks like for America to lead. And we're just getting started. Another big congratulations to Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Their team is here. Where are you, team? There you are. Uh, and they'll be, yes. They'll be joining us uh, after this for a technical panel, for those of you who wish to stay uh, to learn more. Um, big applause and thank you to the NNSA, the National Nuclear Security Administration. <laughs> and everybody who has been involved in this fusion breakthrough that will go down in the history books. You're going to hear more about the details of the experiment from Administrator Ruby and Director Budil. But first, I'm going to turn it over to the President's Science Advisor and Director of the OSTP, uh, Dr. Arati Prabhakar. Thank, Dr. You. Thank you so much. Thanks, Secretary Granholm. What a pleasure to be invited to come celebrate this amazing moment here at the Department of Energy. Um, it's really a privilege to be here. So when I heard this news, <clears throat> for me, the years fell away, and all of a sudden it was 1978. <clears throat> I was a summer student in the middle of my college years, 19-year-old uh, kid, and I got the chance to go work at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And I showed up. And so you got to picture this. I'm wearing my bell bottoms. I've got long black hair. And I show up, and I'm a 19-year-old kid, and they give me a laser to work on. And I said, this is cool. I like lasers. But what, what, like, what's this laser all about? And they said, we think that if you point enough lasers at a pellet of fuel, we want to see if we can get more energy released from fusion than the amount of energy that the lasers deliver into that pellet. And I said, well, that's cool. And I spent three months uh, working on this fun laser. And, you know, and after my adventure with the laser that summer in Livermore ended, I went off and did 
completely unrelated things, but I have always kept an eye out and watched to see what was happening at Livermore as they pursued uh, this idea of ignition, of achieving this kind of controlled fusion reaction for decades. And um, I, I went off and didn't do anything more about fusion, but the people I worked with and their successors kept going. And they went through periods of triumph and they went through tremendous struggles and setbacks. They never lost sight of this goal. And last week, lo and behold, indeed, they shot a bunch of lasers at a pellet of fuel and more energy was released from that fusion ignition than, than the energy of the lasers going in. And, and I just think this is such a tremendous example of what perseverance really can achieve. And I had the great pleasure of meeting the team, whom you'll talk with when you hear uh, the panel in a little while. And they have come from many different parts of the world. They've studied many different fields. Uh, many of them were summer students at Livermore, but decades after I was. So it took not just one generation, but generations of people pursuing this goal. And uh, it's a scientific milestone, scientific energy break even to achieve this. But of course, as with all of these kinds of complex scientific undertakings, it's also an engineering marvel uh, beyond belief. And, and this duality of advancing the research, building the complex engineering systems, both sides learning from each other. This is how we do really big, hard things. So this is just a beautiful example. So, um, you know, I also have been reflecting on how long the journey can be from knowing to doing, because it's a century since we figured out that it was fusion that was going on in, in, in our sun and all the other stars. And in that century, it took, it took so many different kinds of advances that ultimately came together to the point that we could replicate that fusion activity in this, in this controllable way in a laboratory. Uh, and, and I think it's just a reminder that sometimes, even when we know something, it's a very long time before we can turn it into something that we can actually harness and start to be able to use. And as the secretary described, I think it's that, that, really, that prospect now is one step closer and really uh, exciting way. Okay, so, uh, you know, let me just finish by saying I think this is an, an amazing example of the power of America's research and development enterprise. This is what the Department of Energy works every day to support and to drive. It's what our Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House focuses on every day is how do we strengthen and advance this enterprise. And it is an enterprise that the President, President Biden, has championed in a way that no one really ever has before. He submitted the, the, a budget for supporting federal R&D that is the biggest ever uh, that we've had in this country. And so I want to take a moment and congratulate the entire Department of Energy with Secretary Granholm's tremendous leadership, um, the, nuclear, the National Nuclear Security Administration here that has championed this effort for so long, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and especially and particularly all the scientists and engineers uh, across many years uh, who got us to this moment. President Biden loves to say that the one word that defines America is possibilities. And this is such a wonderful example of a possibility realized, a scientific milestone achieved, and uh, a road ahead to the possibilities uh, of, for clean energy and even deeper understanding uh, of the scientific um, uh, principles that are at play here. So thanks again. Congratulations. And uh, all the best uh, from the White House. And now, thank you. Thanks so much. And now it's my privilege to get to introduce Jill Ruby. She is the Undersecretary for Nuclear Security here at the Department of Energy and also the Administrator of NNSA. So we were listening there to the U.S. Energy Secretary and the Science Advisor to the President as they were speaking about a major breakthrough in harnessing fusion energy. Now, this is seen to be a major milestone in a decades-long attempt to source clean, limitless energy, energy rather, from nuclear fusion, the reaction that happens when two or more atoms are fused together, as Bob McDonald was explaining to us. Now, the U.S. Energy Secretary described it as one significant step closer to zero carbon energy. And I want to bring Bob back with us as he listened to all of that. So first, uh, what sort of stood out to you in terms of the significance of what's being described here? 
Well, this was a very successful scientific experiment done in a laboratory to show that the process of fusion can be duplicated here on the Earth and that they can get more energy out of it than they put into it. But let me say that the way they did it in this National Ignition Facility is not the way we're going to be generating electricity. This was to study the process of fusion itself and study the lasers, the incredible lasers that uh, they use to generate the power. Let me, let me tell you about how they did this. Uh, the fuel that they use, this uh, hydrogen helium isotopes, is contained in a pellet that's about that big. And I'm not con kidding, just this the little top of this battery. That's the size of it. And it's like shooting fish in a barrel. So they have 192 lasers that are all aimed at this one tiny little pellet. They all fire at it. And that causes a, a mini explosion that compresses the fuel. And then it goes pop. And it's that pop, that single pop, that's given this fusion reaction. So that's great that they were able to get, you know, more energy came out of the pop than the lasers that went into it. That's the big breakthrough that they're announcing. But if you want to generate electricity with this, the amount of energy that came out of that pot might be enough to make a bowl of soup. Or maybe a pot of soup. That, that's about all they got out of it. If you want to ge generate a huge amount of electricity, you have to do it in a different way. And there is a different way called a plasma torus. And this is really where the generators are coming. And in France right now, there's a giant reactor called ITER, the International Thermal Nuclear Experimental Reactor, that is expecting to get 10 times the amount of energy out that they put into it. And it does it in a very different way. So and I can take you through that if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> Wondering, you know, A, if that is going to be something that will be an even larger breakthrough than this, as you're describing, the method that could certainly produce even more clean energy, but also the way that we're focusing now on a zero carbon solution. How, how big of, you know, a news story is this given that goal? It's a very big deal because we're looking for alternative clean forms of energy that do not heat up the atmosphere. And a lot of them already exist. We know how to capture the energy of the sun with solar power, the wind, uh, geothermal, tidal, all of that stuff already exists. And we need to keep going with that as well. So fusion will be part of a whole montage of energy sources. And it'll be just one other clean one. The beauty of fusion is that once you do get it going, it's self-sufficient and it's uh, 24 seven. You don't have to wait for the sun to come up or you don't have to wait for the wind to blow. It happens all the time. And by the way, the one that you're looking at right here, this is a Canadian invention, General Fusion out of Vancouver. And instead of using lasers, they just use physical pressure. They, they actually squeeze the fuel, just squeeze it and it gets hot enough. And this is underway right now in England. They're building a prototype to try to do the same thing. And again, it gives a pop. And, and it gives you this, this burst of, of energy in a very, very small space. But the, the other way to do it is to create um, a torus. There, there are these, these devices that are shaped like donuts. They're hollow donuts. And inside the donut, you create a burning plasma, a hot, hot, 150 million degree electrically charged gas that is contained by powerful magnets. And that's where the fusion will happen is inside these. And that's continuous. And the, the next stage is to not only get more out than you're putting in, but to keep it burning. They want to call it a burning plasma so that once it ignites, it's it's like a, like a flame. Once you light it, it just keeps on going. Once you do that, then you can start generating electricity. Now, the eater is expected to be finished around, uh, well, we're talking in the 2025 or so it should be uh, get it getting its first plasma going and they're expecting in the 2030s to get that continuous burning and there's another device a smaller one being built called spark that's uh, using more powerful cheaper magnets and uh, these things could be up and running again within around the 2030s so there's still a ways to go before we're seeing electricity out of it but it's at least it's good progress in the right direction Bob, my mind is still blown by the temperatures that you're <laughs> listing off to us. Thank you so much for explaining all of this to us and walking us through this important announcement today. That is Bob McDonald. He is, of course, the host of CBC's Quirks and Quarks, and he's also the author of The Future is Now Solving the Climate Crisis with Today's Technologies. Thank you, Bob. My pleasure.